Welcome students of Critical Care Medicine to the next installment of the Critical Care Survivor Guide. We're going to be addressing shock states next. The key point is that when you have a patient in shock, you don't feel shocked yourself. Shock states are common in the intensive care unit. We see them in patients that have malperfusion or altered perfusion to the tissues of the body. So when we say shock, we're talking about perfusion. There are several things we look at to determine if a patient is in fact experiencing poor perfusion to the body. Here I have outlined in red a lot of the different clinical parameters we'll be watching out for in these types of patients. For starters, there are blood tests that we can order to give us information about perfusion to organs of the body. For example, the troponin, which is elevated in patients that are not perfusing their heart. Similarly, lactate is produced by the body when anaerobic metabolism occurs inside the cells. Lactate is produced when the three carbon pyruvate doesn't have sufficient oxygen, so it is metabolized to pyruvate by lactate dehydrogenase. This only yields two ATPs rather than 36 through the Krebs cycle, and it spits out lactate, which we can assess in a serum value. On exam, these patients can have altered mental status from malperfusion to the brain, or sometimes we see clinical exam changes like altered cap refill times. Another important thing to assess is the urine output. Urine output tapers off when perfusion to the kidneys is decreased. We like to see the urine output to be at least a half ml per kilogram per hour. Anything less than that can be a poor sign that your patient's experiencing ischemia to the kidneys. Remember that the kidneys get about 25% of the cardiac output, so if their perfusion is decreased, it's really a sign that we're having severe shock state. Finally, we have the central venous oxygen saturation. The central venous oxygen saturation is a unique way to look at the perfusion of the body as a whole. We take blood from the central venous line, typically right before it returns to the heart, and we interrogate that blood to see how much oxygen it had to unload and the tissues of the body. When the tissues are very starved for oxygen, they suck up a lot of the oxygen. They're very aggressively pulling it off. Therefore, when the blood returns back to the heart, it's lost more of the oxygen, say more than 30% of its oxygen, in trying to keep perfusion up to the tissues of the body. So central venous oxygen saturation, less than say 70% is a sign of malperfusion. In red, I've highlighted some of the uh, other things we watch for in patients that have shock states. It's important that we keep careful attention to the mean arterial pressure. The mean arterial pressure is a little bit better than the systolic blood pressure alone because the coronary arteries are perfused during diastole. In addition, the formula for cardiac output, you might recall shown here, is the stroke volume times the heart rate. Therefore, when the stroke volume is decreased, one would expect the heart rate to be elevated. Finally, the central venous pressure is a measurement of the pressure of the blood on the venous side, really the right atrial pressure, right before it gets to the right ventricle. This number is important because it gives us an assessment of what the preload is. Remember, the preload helps determine what the stroke volume is to help generate adequate cardiac output. Low central venous pressures, especially anything less than eight in a patient with sepsis, can be indicative that the patient hasn't been fully resuscitated. A normal CVP is typically around one to five. After we've assessed and recognized shock, it's important that we categorize the type of shock the patient has. As shown here, there's a lot of different categories of shock. The first is cardiogenic. This simply means problem with the pump. The heart's not squeezing hard enough. Secondly, we have hemorrhagic shock or hypovolemia, seen in trauma patients, patients that are actively bleeding. Need more volume is always the first step. Next, we have the, the distributive types of shock. Of these, sepsis is by far and away the most common where we have systemic vasodilation. This vasodilation is also seen in neurogenic shock states and anaphylactic shock. And finally, you may sometimes encounter miscellaneous types of shock, such as adrenal insufficiency or obstructive states like cardiac tamponade. I'm going to dive now into the center of the circulation, and we're going to just take one more tour of states of shock. We start up here with cardiogenic shock. Remember, this is a problem with the pump. So when we approach it, we want to use medications that will increase contractility, increase inotropy of the heart. Sometimes we even have to diurese to get the patients back on the right 
right side of the Starling curve. Next, as we move to the left over here, we see the distributive states of shock, starting with anaphylactic and moving to septic. Again, these are cases where we have vasodilation, so the arteries are dilating, and that's impairing forward flow of blood, impairing perfusion to the microcirculation shown down here. Continuing to move forward, we have neurogenic shock. This happens when, with a spinal cord injury, we knock out symptoms when, with a spinal cord causing vasodilation. Then we have obstructive shock, as seen in cardiac tamponade, diagnosed through equalization of pressures on heart catheterization. And up here, we have hypovolemic shock, again, seen with bleeding or cases of trauma. So to summarize, your approach to the patient in shock goes like this. You want to recognize it's a problem. So examining the patient, checking out the lab parameters we talked about. Next, responding quickly is important. The more time the patient spends malperfusing, the worse off the organs are going to be. So we respond typically first with fluids and then pressors tailored to the type of shock state that the patient's in. Next, we restore perfusion. Again, this is through pressors, through fluids, uh, and other uh, organ-specific interventions. And Finally, we need to resolve the shock state. I hope this uh, little lecture has prepared you so that you won't be shocked next time you're taking care of a patient in shock.